heart, knowing that we are coming for everything, marching forwards in numbers, in ones and zeros. The past has no leverage on us. The present expected us to stand still, but time ticked our presence, with the future inscribing us into history's foundation, calling us by our names, including the clicks in our names and clicking of our fingers. Once not born with silver spoons in their mouths, and our makers of the spoon and vendors thereof, came to this earth with answers clenched in fist, unclenching fist, to be the answer. Ours is not a race to come first or be first, but to influence and impact us, energy injectors, conductors of creativity, dancers with the rain, proverbs for our posterity, signaling the speed of ideas, implanting innovation, city stands in tradition. We are outliers, the avant-garde, belonging to secrets whispered in spaces unseen for fear of our splendor. We are resolutely spewing our technician, a slow poison for the norm, perplexing conformity. We're not taking up space only to be muted at the table, not just conduits between what should be and is, not just bodies treading into uncharted public realms, but we are tomorrow's tools, the manifestation of ideals and scripted, leaning on the reassurance of the rising of the sun the next day. Let he without foresight cast the first doubt, whilst we visionaries converge at Urban Festival 2020. Welcome. Thanks, Iska. Um, that poem is available, I think, elsewhere as well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, possibly on the website. And we have been sharing it with. So if you join some of the other urban festival events at urbanfestival.co, you'll be able to um, hear the poem. I'm just going to switch to my very short presentation. Give me one second. I can't find it. There it is gone. Well, I'll just speak through it if I can't find it, it's fine. It's not an issue. So thanks again for joining us today. Um, our public space work at our future cities started under the Future Cape Town banner about 10 years ago, which is quite, quite fun. Um, I think we were initially um, just doing some research uh, in volunteer ways in, um, in a uh, in different public spaces in Cape Town. So we did some 360 panoramic pictures. We called the project Future Spaces. We were doing some videos, just trying to understand public space. And, uh, and then from there over time, we're very fortunate to work with both public and private sector on research and actual interventions um, for public spaces. Um, and I'll run you through, I mean, you can find all of this on our website under our services page, but I'll run you through some of the um, the approaches we've been taking, the kind of work that we've been doing, and then I think we'll get straight into our, our various guests to learn from them as well. So yeah, some of the work, um, maybe just going to share that link to our service page in the chat, yeah. maybe we can just see it. So often we start by conducting research and analysis to identify the challenges. Um, and understand the local context, uh, the culture and the operations. Sorry guys, I'm just gonna get this door to close behind me. Do you mind closing the door? Uh, that's quite important. So it's not just studying the space to, to come up with solutions, but often there's a cultural context, there is operational context. So is the space technically 
For example, at Church Square, it's actually zoned as transport. So there are huge implications um, generally if you're trying to engage with the transport department as some of our guests will share. Uh, the work also entails public and government or community and government engagement. Um, the, the part that people generally miss out in, in the engagement is, uh, well, I suppose it's, it's public, private and government engagement. Um, when you're trying to do any changes in a city, in any South African city, um, in terms of the public realm, you often have lots of meetings, um, not all of them so nice, with the city government and landlords as well. So whether we're hosting labs or site meetings or workshops, uh, those are quite important. Uh, we then do make recommendations for these areas um, over the short, medium and long term so that um, we bring people along with us and don't simply propose long term frameworks um, or don't just procure urban designers or landscape teams to start working on the bigger picture. And you'll see some of that in our projects where we've looked at both short term interventions and longer term interventions at the same time. And then uh, what we really enjoy is, is the piloting the tactical and the quick intervention. So developing and piloting tactical interventions and other uh, rapid and what we call light improvements. They don't need to be temporary. They don't need to be, um, I suppose, light either, but they do need to be uh, purposeful and impactful for the particular space, whether it's sometimes just to bring people together as well, which is also quite important. Um, some of the other work we do is communicating and building awareness. Um, so you, you often have to, you know, some of the best public space projects in the world I visited and, and some of them are often quite uh, more hype than actual uh, success stories. Um, or we often overlook our local success stories because of the hype and media attention given to projects abroad. And some of them of course are amazing, like let's say the Highline or or some other projects we visited in the global south, but um, we do have to communicate and build awareness of the media and stakeholders and community groups. And with each of those groups, there's a very different way. So you wouldn't send a press release to a community group per se, but you need to know how to write a press release. So um, there is a part of public space work which does involve um, speaking to media, conducting interviews, well, not conducting, but being in interviews. So there's a big part of selling the, the story. Um, I know that Leo's on this call and uh, some of the most successful work which has traveled quite a bit is, you know, everyone always remember the parklet. Um, uh, whether it was the biggest or smallest project is irrelevant, but, you know, talking about projects are really important and getting people really excited about that. Um, and then everyone forgets the next part, conducting and monitoring, documenting lessons, and sourcing other best practices. So on some projects we'll, just put up a, an iPhone for a few hours a day and do time lapses just to see if the traffic has increased, um, conduct, you know, I suppose in architectural terms, it's post occupancy engagements maybe, or to see if things are successful. But a lot of work in monitoring and, and also just admitting when things have gone wrong, which is okay. Uh, and then I love the last one, which is identifying or procuring designers. Um, sometimes they're quite elaborate. Um, We'll get, uh, this is the sort of most fun work, getting uh, other teams and ideas and, and firms to pitch for work, whether it's through a charrette or a public call, or just, you know, inviting one or two companies um, to take part um, and ensuring that we include younger, more progressive firms or smaller firms in, in that sort of work. Um, that's, that's technically the areas of, of work um, for our public space work, but it's um, our work is really not in silos. So I'll share with you some of the other areas which we're also going to cover in the coming weeks. Um, let me just try and share that. Um, so we see it as a as as quite a connected mix, and I'm hoping my my um, gradient colors suggest that these are not silos, but areas which which overlap and and uh, and link to each other. So we're currently in the, today we're focusing on this incredible inclusive public spaces, but that is not disconnected from our session on mobility. It's not showing. Let me try again. Yeah. Okay. Pause. Let's go back to screen share. Hello. 
episode. Is it showing now? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, our Zoom's being emotional. Let's just do it from the keynote. Um, so, for example, when, you, when we're looking at a community level um, or precinct level, there are public spaces. When we're looking at urban policies, whether it's um, policies for parking that relates to the public realm. Um, when you're looking at smarter cities, there's also a lot of um, work done in that space. So it's all quite connected. I think my main uh, point I wanted to get across today before um, chatting with some of our friends and actually everyone's our friend who we work with, um, chatting with our friends and guests is that um, uh, Public spaces, the word public suggests so much. And I think many times it's the word public shouldn't really even be in there. I think there's, you can achieve qualities of, of let's say freedom of safety. And I think sometimes the distinguishing between public and private is important, but not the most important. So what is public space? And that's for a number of reasons. I think when you look at a space like Eastern Food Bazaar, it's quite public, people can walk through, it offers quite an interesting sensory experience. Um, you know, technically, you know, our, if something is run privately, let's say the waterfront, is it, you know, if it has public qualities and includes safety and is beautifully designed, um, does it need to be called public space? Um, so I think there are many projects which demonstrate, you know, people don't think parking bays are public space, which we'll get into a bit later. And it is. So I think we should definitely uphold the values and ensure an expansion of public space, but it's also a question of quality. Um, I know that in, in certain neighbors, like in Mitchell's Plain, there's a study at the moment to actually map public spaces and actually consolidate them. Because some of them think there, some people think there are too many, or you know, possibly that's a very difficult thing to do. Possibly there should be fewer of higher quality or manage better or hand it over to community groups. So I think. There's a lot to be said about the word public, but I don't think it's it's the be all and end all. Um, and I think in, in Lagos as well, that question was asked in some of the work Olamide did um, on the Playable City project. Um, are there any questions so far before we chat with some of our, our guests? Oh, I've got a comment. Nice to see connected holistic approaches. Too often in my experience of researching public space, it is understood or designed or managed in a fragmented way. Unfortunately, it still is managed in a fragmented way. So when you are trying to do anything on land that is owned by, well, managed by city parks, that's a very different experience to projects which land on pieces of land which are owned by or managed by, let's say, transport and public works, which will be a much longer time frame, And that is also very different to projects um, which are on, let's say, sports and recreational city libraries. Um, as much as you want things to connect, I think from not to pick on government, but from their perspective, dividing everything up is, is kind of the easiest way to do things. And so we've seen across Cape Town in particular, uh, groups taking over spaces with food gardens and instead of, you know, applying for a five-year lease or a one-year lease for people who've maybe never managed a lease or, or don't have the experience to apply for one, People have just gone ahead and actually implemented the project. So I think there's a lot to be said for the connected nature of the research, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, I think I'll, let's just maybe I'll take you through some of the um, work on Talfus in Mitchell's Plain. Um, just remember that there, let me just see if I can share the right screen, um, that a lot of this is available afterwards. So we're not going to cover every project in depth and um, let's just see if we can find that one. Can you all share, see my screen? Mm -hmm. So in Tafa it was there was no brief really. Michael, we met a few years ago, Wesley as well from GAP. Michael lives in the area and the entire focus was on what you can do. So paint one wall, move one brick, add something. Um, at the moment, we lucky to have received a very small grant to work on a bigger project. But maybe Michael, for a few minutes, you can just share 
why you think this space needed people to come together. I think that's that's been the most important part for me. Um, yeah, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you, um, Rashik, um, and welcome everybody. Um, as Rashik mentioned, um, I think we uh, met in 2018, myself, Rashik, um, and Wes, um, when I presented initially, um, the idea that I had um, for um, a few of the spaces uh, in Tafelsa, um, considering, you know, that I live in the area, um, it's been uh, difficult over the years and, you know, working in government, trying to get um, support from government, um, especially local government, to upgrade uh, the public spaces. Um, so it has been, you know, a struggle over the years, but uh, thankfully, you know, meeting uh, with Rashid, um, uh, young urbanist guys, especially with, you know, we got together and then um, forged a vision for um, two of the public spaces as uh, in, in the presentation. Because, you know, when I met with um, Luke and Rashid, um, and if you look back um, where we were, when we started out, and um, as you know, it, it time you know, for government to, to come on board but thankfully you know uh, that happened um, over the uh, last couple of um, 18 or 24 months um, but from where I was as you can see you know, um, in the pictures um, that is you know um, currently the state of most of the open spaces and for me it, it was a problem because you know my big passion apart from you know working in government full time is public open spaces and uh, mural art and uh, you know in the pictures um, that is not how i uh, see uh, you know what a public space or park should be um and also you know from my uh, travels abroad um, seeing how public spaces and spacious parks are being developed and um, how user friendly they are and currently that is another situation uh, in this plane uh, especially in town stuff where um, the parks and public spaces uh, is no go areas so the picture that we're looking at is um, the two spaces that we have identified uh, we have developed and then also upgraded uh, even further. Um, it was a struggle, but as I said, you know, um, this is where we are. So we've made a lot of progress in terms of getting partners on board, uh, support, uh, especially from the government, um, from the public, which uh, initially, you know, they were, um, they were set from state, but um, seeing you know how the pro uh, project can develop and what we can do and what we are able to achieve, uh, in those cases, you know, they would stay by uh, and uh, some sort of a ground show from everybody wanting to see uh, what uh, the space will look like um, at the end of the day. And as you know, um, we uh, the problems that we are facing in in those areas uh, regarding crime um, and substance abuse. Um, so what happened over the years, you know, um, the gangs took over the public spaces and the city moved out. They not uh, uh, been on board to, to service uh, the public spaces for obvious reasons. But through this, you know, we managed to get them back on board and, you know, uh, providing them much needed services. And as a result of that, you know, uh, the community members are um, once again, you know, reclaiming uh, um, the public spaces, and that is the, the, the ultimate object, um, objective for us, is to provide safe spaces and make use of, you know, what is currently there, and just develop it, beautify it, uh, up, um, and just upgrade it, so that uh, people can come out and enjoy the spaces, you know, um, uh, at the end of the day. So yeah, here we are, and uh, thankfully, um, you know, for um, for the help and support of. Um, Rashik and uh, Wiz and all the other uh, sponsors, uh, we will definitely uh, reach our ultimate objective. Um, Henry, I'm not sure if you're if you're still here. I know you have to run. I'm just going to check if Henry's still here. Okay. Otherwise, we'll just. Ah, uh, so Henry, if you're still if you're still here, Henry's from the the placemaking team at the waterfront. Um, if you could maybe just share a bit about why looking into the programming and the uses of Battery Park, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Battery Park. Uh, if you could just share a minute or two about, about that, why that is important for, for your work at the waterfront. Hi, Rashik. 
Good uh, afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I have two minutes before I need to head out, so, so I'm going to try to answer your question in uh, in that in that two minutes. Um, yeah, so our role at the, the VNA is, is far from the development team's role who does the, the real amazing work, and I'm happy to see that um, Kai is on the call as well, and he could perhaps talk more to sort of the, the design process. Um, our role is to, to really create a vibrant and active public space using placemaking principles. Um, yes, we do look at infrastructure and light development using elements such as light to quicker, cheaper, but the, the majority of the work centers are uh, around activation. And with, with Battery Park, we had a, a unique opportunity to, to build something built on top of the, the remnants of, of one of the oldest military fortifications. So in staying true to the, the space, um, the, the idea was to, to build a green open public space as a, as a sort of gift back into the city. It also extends our, our borders and um, improves our um, corridor and our, our links back into the city. Um, Guy and the, the team at DHK were, were extra, um, instrumental in, in designing that space. What we came to our future cities for was to, to conduct some research for us on um, really what uses um, and programming could inform how we activate the space um, post-development. So we utilized sort of a, a series of focus groups. Um, OFC did quite a bit of, at the time FCT, <laughs> did quite a bit of uh, research and case studies for us, conducted a number of, of site works. And coming out of those sessions, there were a few key themes, such as the need for active spaces in the, in the city center and surrounds where people could play sports. Uh, the unique differentiator here was that they had access to water, so water sports remained critical. The opportunity to bring art into the public spaces, which also really centers around our, our need to remain inclusive. So how we represent culture, identity, and ownership in, in public spaces. Um, from from that, you know, there's there's a numerous uh, sort of activities that we currently run in the uh, in the, the space. Um, one event we were particularly proud of is our um, Waterfront Canal Challenge, which is done in conjunction with uh, the Rotary Club of the Waterfront, which is an open water swim through the canal around the marina and. Um, and back. What stood out for us in the in the process was really the ability to, to democratize um, um, really with the barriers for people to inform um, the process. Um, it was really in, in our view a human-centered approach to, to how we program and activate um, the state, the, the, the space. Um, and really we're sort of quite um, happy that we were able to bring in a mix of designers. Um, stakeholders within our environment, architects, uh, space managers, as well as, uh, you know, everyday uh, users of the, the VNA waterfront and consumers. Um, so, yeah, we, we were really appreciative of the work that, that OFC did with us and continue with engage with the, with the team on our public spaces um, as we emerge out of um, uh, COVID-19 and the impact that it has had on, on public space. Thanks, Henry. Thanks so much for, for popping in. I think Guy on that, that's a good transition <laughs> to, to, to move over to, um, I suppose, one of my favorite projects, which never happened, uh, although uh, competes quite closely with Lior, the um, Seapoint Library winning entry. So I think there's a, <laughs> this one's just a bit of a different scale. I'll share my screen and uh, let's hope it works this time. But the city left for sure proposal. Um, Sister, can you just confirm that it is sharing? <laughs> you know, I'm yeah, sure. sure. um, this is, um, I think this must be Suud's hands. Yeah, Suud's hands. Colleagues. They created the model. I'll just share some of the, uh, some of the images as well, but um, once we, this, once we, I think it was myself, yourself and Alfredo, I'm not sure if Khalid was there, but once we decided to flip the problem upside down with cars and vehicles at the bottom and people on top, I think the public spaces became easy, right? Although it's a windy area. <laughs> uh, yes and no. Um, 
I'm, go I'm, gonna, I'm just going to quickly pick up on, on what Henry was saying about, about Battery Park because, um, you know, and reflecting on, on your involvement there, um, because we, of course, uh, were involved in Battery Park from right from the urban design stages where we were looking at, at just the idea of locating a, a park there uh, within, the, within the, the broader city fabric. And the idea there was very much about um, creating continuity between the Vienna waterfront and the rest of the city and the, the park becoming an intrinsic part of that uh, in that it extended the public space network of the city um, into the VNA waterfront. And, it, and the reason I mention that is that that notion was, I think, absolutely central to our ideas on city lift, uh, which was very much driven by the idea of the continuity of the city. And rather than um, the, the demolition of the foreshore freeways providing, or, or not, but, but the project providing an opportunity to do something um, completely different and radical. I think we were radical, but it was it was fundamentally about continuity, um, extending the city grid um, over the the dropped freeways, <coughs> and ex extending the city's public space network. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, it should really leave and go and find a public space. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, that's you know central to that notion is is our ideas about uh, a public space network being central to a pedestrian movement sy system, um, and a pedestrian movement system being central to a functional city, and especially a functional city centre. Um, and then, of course, looking at the major public space elements of this part of the city being. The, the Greenpoint Park and uh, the Seapoint Promenade um, and that yellow line that we saw on the previous slides, the notion that we extend the Seapoint Promenade uh, through uh, the City Lift project um, all the way around um, Table Bay, eventually as far as, as Bloberg, um, and, and use this project to create connection between, between otherwise disconnected parts of the city at, at strategic and local levels. And then I think another key driver was the idea of turning constraints into opportunities. So, you know, that, that idea that you mentioned, Rashik, that we came up with of, of turning the, pro the problem on its head and flipping the freeways, dropping the, because the big issue with the freeways, of course, was, was that they created practically uninhabitable ground spaces, public spaces. So the idea that we drop the freeways to the ground and raise the city and lift the city over them um, provided a, uh, an opportunity to, to create a, a habitable public space where previously we'd had an uninhabitable public space. And of course also the, the, the challenge there is that when you've got a, a, a road system running, on a, run, running at grade and you've got a bridge over that and deck over that, very difficult to put buildings on that deck from a structural point of view, but relatively straightforward to turn it into a public park. Um, so the, the linear park became a kind of central uh, idea in the scheme um, and a kind of metaphor for the, for the road that, that sits underneath. And then I think by the same token, you know, the, the interface with the harbour. Um, very early on, we had to deal with the challenge of, of the harbour being um, an international port and subject to international maritime legislation. Uh, and all of, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, constraints to do with security and customs and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you need an impermeable barrier between the port and the rest of the city. Uh, and of course, the idea of bringing the city to the to the harbour only to whack a great wall or, or fence across it was was a was a really nasty idea, but this gave us the opportunity to elevate ourselves above it and and create a grand balcony overlooking the harbour that becomes a, a primary public space component for the city uh, and deals with that that security issue. Um, of course, people can still get into the harbour by jumping off the balcony, but they're not going to get out again because they'll have broken legs. So that kind of solved that one. Um, and of course, there were 
challenges around environmental challenges, um, which you know, we were in the midst of the water crisis at this at this point. Uh, currently, we're not, but that's not to say it's not going to come back, and those challenges will persist. Um, and so, then using the idea of a podium to generate vast reservoirs to store captured rainwater that could then come back and feed the, the park system was, was a central component. Uh, and I think also a response to density, um, you know, recognizing that the kind of density that we were proposing and the density that was required to generate both affordable housing and have a, um, a viable project uh, meant that you needed uh, public spaces to set off against that. Um, but that those public spaces nevertheless needed to have a have a certain amount of intimacy. So although our central park is a very long space, it's also a relatively narrow space. So that you always um, have a relationship to the to the city around you whenever you you're in that space. Um, yeah. What else? I should turn the question back to you, Rashik. What what, um, what would you add on that? Um, in terms of I think, our, I think uh, the challenge was scale. I think the the foreshore is just always had an issue for whether it's wind or harbour. And I think striking that balance between intimacy and because once we actually mapped the spaces, they were gigantic. You know, there were you mm. know even just you know the spaces around the artscape. We reduced those with buildings because they were too large. Mm. Um, and you didn't want something which was like most precincts around the world, which was lots of glass, but it feels quite dead. So I think the difficulty was constantly going back and forth and saying, what is, I think we had augmented reality, luckily thanks to the Oricon team. So we could actually step into some of these spaces. I've got a photo of you with these, um, the giant, I'm sure now it's just this tiny headset three years later, but you had this giant headset you were walking around and we realized it was still too big in a way and um, mm -hmm. the, the parks and, and uh, so I think I think that was that was tricky. And you know, we wanted people to to go between larger and smaller spaces and, and feel protected and sheltered. And so a lot of the public space work was maybe the link between the harbor and the Cape Town station. So I know if everyone here, if you've been to Cape Town and walked around the foreshore or the civic center, nothing there is it's public, but nothing there makes you want to stay there. Um, and the wind will take you somewhere else if you're not careful. So Think, yeah that was that was the big thing we wanted to address was was bringing things back to the human scale um and i think yeah in many ways there's still work to be done on that um if we could, you know if we had a chance to zoom in a bit more but thanks guy thanks that was great yeah Rashid, we've had a question thrown at us from um urban festival i don't know who's behind the urban festival banner so, so i don't have a name but um he she says why include the freeway at all? Just induces more driver car dependence. Couldn't have been a, a couldn't it have been a sort of always struggle to pronounce this embarcadero embarcadero. I think I got that right in San Francisco situation where the freeway would be removed entirely. Um, so a quick response from me on that, uh, and I think there's 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 two points to make here. One is that you know we we had a a big debate early on in this, in terms of where do we pitch ourselves? Um, because if you remember, when the when the RFP came out, it was very much a development-led um, proposition. It wasn't simply an ideas competition. Um, and we wanted to be as radical as we could, but at the same time, have some prospect of actually winning and being appointed and being able to continue with the project. And we knew that the city's inclination was actually to complete the freeways um, as, as they are, or as they were originally designed. And so we felt that pragmatically we needed to include the, uh, the, the continuity of mobility. Um, but where we were slightly subversive in that is that we introduced sections uh, below the below the deck to integrate integrate the strategic mobility system back into the the city's local mobility system, and we also included um, public transport significant public transport components in that um, under deck freeway system. 
Um, and I think the second point to make is that, you know, that there are also other examples around the, the world, like Austin's Big Dig, um, like the recent work in, um, I think it's in Madrid, uh, and then there's also the work in, um, uh, what's our favorite city in Colombia? Yeah. Medellin, um, where they've buried freeways and turned the surface into park space, um, but kept the, the mobility functions. Um, so I think that the, the great arguments for both. Um, what's been very interesting over the last couple of months, of course, is to see how the cars have disappeared off the freeways because everyone's working from home. So, you know, it's a valid question now as yeah. to how is mobility going to look next year and the year after and in five years' time? And the reality is we don't know the answer. Yeah. <clears throat> Leo, just crossing over to you. We've only got 15 minutes. We've got Olamide and Leo to get to. Thanks, Guy. Um, for those who can remain past one, please do. We'll cover your, your questions. Um, Leo, speaking about cars, um, just to give some context, we were very lucky to be approached by Block to work on their program called Urban Interventions, which is a lot of wild, wonderful projects to rethink city space and Block's passion about urban spaces. Um, we're very well known now for the parklet, taking away <laughs> two cars. Infamously so. You know, why, why, get a, why go on the crazy journey with us? I think it was like six months of application and two days of installation or something crazy. Yeah, look, I think for us, you know, every city needs to be challenged by stakeholders, you know. We're the ones, you know, citizens and cities, we're the ones who use cities. So we, we know what we want and we know what we expect from spaces and what we need. So for us, it made absolutely no sense to be on Regent Road and look at this road every day and, and for it to not be, you know, open to the public. There is no, you know, some of the insights, I mean, there were such beautiful stories that came from this project, you know, old people who had no place to sit along Regent Road unless they bought an overpriced cup of coffee. Um, kids who live on Main Road in the apartments, you know, surrounding our, our offices who would come home from school and gather outside because they didn't want to, you know, go straight home. Um, and, and one of the things that I loved best about that park, it was just how, you know, there was absolutely no vandalism. You would think that being left on Regent Road, unsupervised, um, being in the public domain, uh, that you would have some graffiti or someone would try and take some kind of ownership of it. And no one ever did, you know, it was, it was treated with such utmost respect. I mean, there was even a, a couple that met on the parklet who ended up, I think, getting engaged. There was all these heartwarming stories and you kind of think to yourself, well, if nobody's, you know, pushing for these public spaces to be created, you're, you're missing out on these moments and opportunities. Uh, for people to really live in their cities. Cities shouldn't be, you know, these public spaces shouldn't be transient. They should, they should hold people. They should give people the opportunity to, to really live out their lives. Um, so, yeah, you know, for us as a developer, you know, we've always said that we don't just sell four walls. We sell the city. Um, so for us, it really needs to work very, very hard on a, on a group level and on an individual level as well. So I think that's why it was, yeah, there we go. So there's some of the, so we did capture, we created this um, Instagram page called Faces of the Parklet, where we kind of interviewed people and, you know, it was just a, a child could just sit on the street. Yeah, in a safe like, space, yeah. you know, um, and there was a bit of planting. Um, and we would, of course, go and sit and eat our lunch there and just, yeah. It was a wonderful space. It was also, you know, I think it, it brought about a really healthy and robust debate about the importance of cars over people. And it was kind of polarizing in that sense um, to kind of learn what, what some people deemed yeah. important. Some people obviously care about people and other people care about parking near to where they need to be. Yeah. So it was an interesting conversation. <laughs> huh? We didn't have to stage any of the photos of young and old. And yeah, no, it was such a show. beautiful mix of people every single day. Yeah. Um, thanks, Leo. Olamide, I suppose the most radical of, of all, and sorry for taking so long to get to you. We can talk about this all day. Um, but in, in your city, your heart, um, we were very lucky to have you there. Um, 
but the British Council has a program called Playable City and Olamide was conducting research and overseeing that with Nigerian and British um, designers. And I'm going to see if I can start with a photo. Um, maybe share a bit about how that came about. And nice to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, hi. <laughs> Sorry just to drop you in. Um, I like this is the iconic photo. You're in a, you're in a taxi. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. So how did the project come come about? Um, so, yeah, so so in Lagos, this was actually a while ago, so I can't even remember a lot of the details, but um, but in Lagos, we have, we don't really have, we have public spaces that we may not call public spaces. Um, and so there isn't really, I don't think we've come up with a definition of what public space is uh, for the Lagos context. Um, and so this was an interesting project because um, Playable City, who are based in the UK, kind of came to Lagos and were like, oh wow, this is such an interesting space. Um, and people are using space uh, as they should and as they, as they want to and as they need to. Um, but how can, we, how can we kind of make this more um, exaggerated? How can we kind of really expand on this definition how can we expand on the way people are using public space and also how can we make this kind of a policy um discussion as well so it was quite interesting because i think from the uk the idea of what public space is um is a little bit different to maybe how we were kind of taking over space in lagos um, and as you can see there you know, these are regular activities, like the bottom uh, right, where there's kind of kids playing football on the street. These are regular activities because there aren't these spaces that are created or designed. Um, and so, and what actually happens when, when you know, children or, or adults take over street spaces is the cars actually know that on Saturday or on Sunday in your community, these spaces are gonna be used by kids or, or whoever to play football or games or uh, ride bicycles. So the cars actually stop using these spaces and move around um, and, and go a different way to get to wherever they're trying to get to. So, I mean, I think these kind of, I guess they're kind of guerrilla activities um, happen all the time. But I think what has happened since then is this discussion about how do we create these spaces that, are, that can be used more often than let's say on a Saturday or on a Sunday, and how you know how do they how do they function? How can we make them more accessible? Um, so actually, this is also a funny funny photo because um, on the right hand side of this picture there is a park, um, but as you can see, to get to the park you kind of have to cross this highway. Um, so some of the pro some of the the projects that came up were about how can we bring people together in spaces they already occupy and kind of make it more of community spaces. Um, and, and one of them was this, this idea of, um, of, of the bus, of the buses, um, and they're called Danfo. Um, and so you create these kind of um, spaces where you can, you can discuss with other buses and other people on the bus, um, and whether it's by written text or by phone, um, and so it's the idea of you're continuously having this conversation and creating communication and communities within these kind of moving public spaces. Um, so there was quite there was quite a lot of different interventions. Um, there was one which was within within a park and how do we kind of activate the space um, and, and using kind of technology and using kind of interesting um, communication methods with like, how do we communicate with like trees? How do we communicate with plants? Um, and how do we kind of get people to kind of activate the space as well? So it was it was quite uh, a, an interesting project. Um, it kind of brought a lot of thinking around what public space is, how do we define public space? How do, how do we use public space? And how do we activate public space? Um, and, um, and since then, I mean, we've done a lot of work uh, with, government officials uh, here in Lagos around, around these topics of activation and what is public space, where can we use public space, but now we're looking at how can we um, reclaim space. So we're looking at like wetlands, 
wetlands uh, areas and thinking about how can we kind of create uh, more kind of recreational spaces within those um, yeah. uh, within the wetlands of Lagos. And Lagos is obviously on water, so there are a lot of wetland spaces that can that are kind of sitting follow at the moment, um, not being activated. So we're trying to think about how we can do that. Thanks, Alambele. Nice. Do you want to tell us 20 seconds about your initiative now in Lagos and some of the things you've been doing? Yeah, so um, so I run an organization called Lagos Urban Development Initiative. Um, and most of our work is around advocacy, um, but we're doing yeah, advocacy to make Lagos more livable um, and sustainable. Um, but most of our work is around mobility, so NMT um, and also public space. So yeah, as I said at the moment, we're doing the kind of wetlands. Um, and in terms of NMT, we're working with um, local communities, trying to understand, trying to understand where the young girl fits in. Um, because a lot of the conversations we have, whether it's with government or within communities, young uh, females are not present in those conversations. So we're trying to, we're working with them to understand. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? All, all women in general, just tra in transport yeah. things. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so we're doing some understanding what their needs are, but also training them to ride bicycles because we, we're doing a lot of stuff around mobility and, and NMT. But what, when we go on the street, the only people we see riding bicycles are, um, are male. So it's also about, I'm trying to understand, okay, why don't you ride bicycles? How can we get you guys to ride bicycles and things like that? So, yeah, and also kind of looking at it from government perspective, trying to get them yeah. to kind of put in more policies and infrastructure um, for NMT and, and um, yeah, active transport. Thanks, Lamide. Wesley, I know we might have skipped you, but how's, what's, what's the latest in the project? When do we go to site? <laughs> Maybe tell people what we're doing there. It, it sounds very big, but it's actually a very small intervention. Well, we have big dreams. Um, but like you alluded to, we, we, we do things one small intervention at a time, which is the magic of this project, because it gives us the opportunity to engage with the community um, and draw from the local skill resource um, and actually work very closely with them and, and kind of figure out what's the right intervention to do. Um, so just to, to fill everyone in, Michael uh, gave us an introduction to sort of our, our grander visions, but... What we're planning to do with the seed funding we've got is um, sort of an experimental placemaking initiative, which will entail us going out to site probably on the 24th of October. I know Rashik wanted it to be sooner, but we, we've had to gather the resources to get this, get this to, to work. So, <laughs> yeah. So the 24th of October is our site day and ourselves. Um, OFC and many community helpers uh, will get together on site and we're going to plant trees. Uh, we're going to build benches um, and do some landscaping. And we've got a world renowned uh, mural artist. Uh, I mean, the, this fancy term of mural artist, he's a graffiti artist and I think he's, he loves that title. So. I'm going to be politically correct and say he's a, a really good graffiti artist and he's going to be painting about a hundred meter long mural um, on that same day. So it's, it's an action day. The community will be out, will be out. There'll be skills transfer um, and in the process creates a really beautiful and safe, safe place to sit. I'll briefly run you through with what we're actually building. So we've come up with a, a very simple toolkit. Um, the toolkit is uh, comprised of readily available materials, very simple tools and very low skills are required to actually install these. Uh, we're using stormwater pipes, um, manhole sections and concrete culverts that you'd usually see used in an infrastructural way. Um, we're aiming to use these in a practical um, a way to, to sort of create beautiful places for people to sit. Uh, and the tree is very important in the whole thing as it, it gives us that shade that's so needed in, in Mitchell's Plain Parks, especially. Yeah, there's a gigantic nature reserve. Um, yeah. What's it called? Well, the Volkhat Nature Reserve. I mean, I don't think people are hanging out there in the daytime. And 
just another thing about the site is, you know, that is it AZ Berman, that road is sort of like a freeway, which cuts through the middle of, of two parts of the neighborhood as well. A bit of apartheid planning there. Um, yeah. Thanks, Wesley. And um, I'll accept your apology about the delay. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll just, go, I know we've got no time, but that is the point of this one hour. There are questions which Siska has sent me, which I will run through. First question. Um, what are your thoughts on public spaces being policed in the city bowl where the poor are excluded? Anybody want to tackle that? I'm happy to tackle that. I think there's a there's a lot of, I mean, I think not just in Cape Town, but I think the pandemic has shown a lot of municipalities to be ineffective in dealing with 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 humans and people. And so even in the, the most difficult circumstances, the most difficult weather. There's been quite a harsh treatment of people, and I don't think it's just recent. Um, police authorities don't speak to city authorities, and metro police do things differently to private landlords. Um, so I think it points to that fragmentation again, and we can point in every single direction, but contrary to the incidence of poor treatment, there's been lots of good treatment. Um, we've seen Seapoint connect with I think it was Gogozo Kailicha and community networks. We've seen the police station in Seapoint, for example, the soup kitchens we've seen. I think there's, I'm very careful about using News24 as a news source on everything. So I would say there's been a lot of good work and I think there's a need for authorities to work closer together, which is a diplomatic answer because they often don't. And as an example, the authority which takes down somebody's informal settlement, whether it's legal or not, in bad weather, is a different authority to the one that commissioned it to happen. And it's sometimes on ESCOM land. And so less, that's all less important, but I think there's been a lot of um, good work as well. But um, I think uh, our health and, and the pandemic has taught us what it means to be human. And I think we, shouldn't, we should definitely not miss that in all of this. Uh, question, how can we ensure safer public transport methods to and from these spaces? Um, I'm a bit, not right leaning, but uh, I do think there should be zones of zero tolerance for especially women and girls on public transport and walking to and from public transport. I don't think they should be harassed or approached in certain zones. I think there should be public space and people should be free to hang out, loiter, but I think there, there's a level of aggression, which I don't think um, in particular women should deal with in the workplace, in public space, on transport, off transport. So you can imagine somebody's entire day, if we're not drawing some lines in terms of the people's safety is, is impacted um, consistently. So people are just constantly a threat. And I think that, um, I think it's, I think it's, it's not just the public transport method. So I think in some countries they've done, you know, women only trains or carriages, but I think we need to go beyond that and look at the precincts. Um, and, and look at the whole transport experience. It's not just on the public transport. Um, the other questions are quite broad. Nicholas Smith raised a hand. Uh, I know it's just after one. Nicholas Smith, can we, can we, yeah, can we cross over? How does the tech work? Oh, she's gone. She's afraid. Oh, no, yeah. Oh, she's back. <laughs> Nicholas Smith, you can ask your question if you want to go for it now. Mm -hmm. I think Nicholas Smith might have stage fright. <laughs> Hi there. Oh, there you go. No stage fright. Hi, Nicola. Sorry, I'm dialing in from Botswana. The, the lines are quite, um, <laughs> quite uh, unpredictable, but it seems like I'm back. Can you hear me? You're, you're loud and clear. Thank you. Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, thank you for the great presentations. Um, really enjoy it. Um, I, I am from Cape Town, but I'm now based in Khabarone, Botswana. Um, and uh, the problems we are seeing here are mostly um, the space is provided. There's actually uh, too much public space provided, but not enough money being spent on utilizing this space. So no trees being planted, no, um, yeah, no 
grass being provided for soccer playing or nets provided nothing. So it's basically just becoming vacant pieces of land. Um, I was wondering in in the Lajos um, cases if if the same is happening there and people are just owning the spaces themselves and uh, neighboring people are pitching in money to make it nicer or if government is actually starting to spend money on these spaces. I think Olamide had to step off. So we'll send her that question and we'll put, we'll put you an email contact as well. Um, the okay. sense that I got was that um, yes and no, but that the money was spent, I suppose, more on formal areas and areas. Um, so from the images and from the site visit she did, there was, you know, parks are reasonably well maintained, but that it was the in-between unofficial public spaces which were not being given the right attention. So um, some areas near water, some areas in between buildings, the streets between homes. Um, but I can't give you the official answer, um, but Olamide, we're happy to put you in touch with her. Are there any other questions? We'll just have a look. Oh, there were two Q and A's. I'm getting better at this. Um, <laughs> thanks to everyone who has to drop off, but we will just keep going for another five, 10 more minutes. Uh, there's a Q and A, how can we, I think we've covered all the, the Q and A's. How do we ensure safety? I think that's a big question. Um, I think the safety question, there's a, I mean, Guy probably has the right words, but um, the, there have been some proposals where, you know, the, the addition of, I think there's an idea that only the public can make space, uh, public space safer. I think it's private buildings. So in some cases, uh, buildings around the space, um, passive surveillance. So actually having a mixture of programs, be it hotels or cafes or creches or um, so we don't look at, at safety in public spaces all about the number of CCTV cameras and, and security guards, but rather uh, a number of, um, of, yeah, a number of ways to, to achieve safety over time rather than um, safety purely by security guard. Guy, I'm not sure if you have, you have better words. <laughs> better language. I think you're kind of talking about passive surveillance. Yeah. Um, also developing for safety, like building things. It's really about activity. The more people that there are using the space, funny enough, the safer it is. Um, because people, you know, you've got, to, you've got to work on a basis that the vast majority of people are uh, not going to commit crime and are not interested in committing crime and are there to enjoy themselves in the space and to look out for one another. Um, and for the, for the small minority that are going to commit crime, the opportunity for them to commit crime is always far greater the, um, when they make up a disproportionate number. In other words, the fewer people in any space, um, the greater the likelihood that the criminal in the space is going to be able to, to operate. Um, so I think you know, the success of public spaces is down to making them attractive. How do we get people in there? And by attractive, that's not necessarily an aesthetic thing. Um, it's partly a functional thing. We were talking about Battery Park earlier. Um, and you know, when we started looking at that, uh, the notion that there was going to be activity in the space was, was central. Um, but the early thinking around that was that we were simply going to replace the five-a-side football um, pitches that had, that had been, uh, before, we, before we started the project, they'd been in place next to the canal. Um, and then through your work, Rashik, uh, the notion that we introduced a skate park and basketball um, took off. And it was a really prescient notion uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, five-a-side football pitches um, only work for teams. So they only work for organized sport. You've got to book them, you've got to, whereas both of the other two components are far more democratic. 
they're open to anyone, anytime. You can turn up and play. You can turn up and skate. You can turn up and join whoever's playing basketball. Um, yeah, basketball, obviously, you can also play formally with teams. But the one at Battery, and I'm sure that does happen at Battery Park, but that court is used every hour of the day um, by people just turning up and playing. And so those two components have generated so much activity in that space that it's kind of always safe. Uh, so yes, there's there's good lighting, um, yes, there's security, uh, and those things are important. Um, yes, the, the space is overlooked a little, um, but it's really the fact that we generated so much activity in that space, um, good positive activity, has, is what has made it such a successful space. Guy, there was also just a, another question about the inner city of Johannesburg. I know your DHK does work all over the country and continent, but densely, densely populated parts that are still unsafe, um, very difficult issue to get around in some contexts. I suppose, depending on the city and town you're in, it's sometimes too many people, too few people, but I, I don't think it's about the density, right? It's, it's. No, I missed the first part of your question. Um, Zoom decided to cut you off for a second there. Uh, um, in the city of Johannesburg, the question is around a comment passive surveillance does seem to be key, but in inner city Joburg, there are very densely populated parts that are the most unsafe. Um, and Temba has just said he thinks it's, he or she thinks it's the nature of activities. Yeah. Uh, that is a big part. Um, I see, yeah. Maybe Temba can explain. Sisko, can you maybe just, uh, because I, I'd hate to sort of reduce the question to. But I would, I would, I would turn around and say, if we're talking about inner city Joburg, is it that unsafe or is that a perception? Um, and who is it unsafe for? I mean, you know, I know Hillbrow is perceived as the, as the most dangerous bit of any city in South Africa. And yes, at night it is. Um, but at night, it's like late at night when there aren't that many people on the streets, it is. Um, during the day, it's it's edgy, it's um, vibey, but and it's and probably a good chance you'll get pickpocketed if you don't have your wits about you. But is it that unsafe? I'd, I'd question that. And areas of, of uh, other areas of downtown Joburg as well. Um, you know, I think we sh we should. Um, we need to question perceptions of, of, of being unsafe with the reality of being unsafe. Um, and the reality of being unsafe will be revealed through st statistics, crime statistics, which I don't have at my fingertips. Um, but perceptions around being unsafe are, are, are very often, um, you know, they become, they become propagated, they become endlessly repeated and they become taken as fact uh, when they aren't necessarily fact. Timba, you've actually just joined us. Can you can you maybe just share a bit more? Um, am I coming up? Yes. You're loud and clear. Go for it. Thanks. Yeah, I was just starting to type a response and um, I really appreciate the way you've answered that guy. Um, I think your assessment of Hillbro is spot on and I think raising this thing about perception is, is a huge part of it. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll be curious if you guys have any thoughts about how do we kind of address this gaps between perception and the reality um, as they seem to change without a lot of relation to each other at times. Um, but I do think that in other parts of the central city area, especially those that have less private security, um, there are some genuinely unsafe parts that, that are densely used and and I think the risk of being mugged is is higher than than just whether you have your wits about you or not. Um, mm. And you can easily witness uh, people being mugged and everyone else kind of around them continuing with their life. Um, but I, I, I think I think you're spot on with with a lot of how you responded. Yeah, Timber, in in the Belleville CBD of Cape Town, um, which is quite a amazing cultural mix 
in terms of people from across the continent and from across Cape Town. It's the busiest taxi rank. It's 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 officially the busiest interchange. Cape Town Station is not really an interchange. It's a sort of a an end point in some ways. So it's the busiest interchange in terms of switching transport, walking. Um, not necessarily the biggest or busiest by car traffic, and you know it's perception which which drives the fear. The statistics don't suggest that it's the most violent or the most dangerous. Um, and and um, in the daytime, you know, women generally walk through large parts of the, the Belleville town center. And um, there's a reasonable level of tolerance of different cultures. At night, we've observed um, generally men on the street having coffee after mosque. We've observed football on the streets. Um, I think the lighting is an issue. I think the lack of investment is an issue. I think the urban management is an issue despite being a mayoral priority. I don't know which mayor's priority, but some mayor's priority. So, so I'm, I, the people have certainly never been an issue. Yes, some of the minibus taxis are crazy and drive a bit recklessly, but the pavements are too small. They're still small three, four years later, too, too narrow, sorry, to the busiest taxi rank. So I think, yeah, I'm hesitant, I'm hesitant to, to default to perception. Um, you know, mm. trade is enough sanitation blocks, toilets. Um, but the rentals in those, uh, which is my insight of the day, <laughs> the rentals at Bellstar Junction um, per square meter due to the foot traffic are comparable and better than Rosebank and Santon. So you're looking at, if you look at some of the leases, uh, I think it's called the company's called Spire. You're looking at 350 to 400 rand a square meter to rent a space at that train station, and you inching upwards of you know some of the you know the Bree Streets, which is between 250 and 500 a square meter, and parts of Sandton and Rosebank. So yeah, we are, we we like to look at the economics mixed with the people, mixed with the what is probably sometimes just, and I hate to default it, government's failure um, in keeping people safe and in orchestrating the different parts to come together and yeah i'm not sure if anybody else has anything to add to that only thing i might um add and then i'm gonna have to go unfortunately um but i think just picking up on Tampa's point about the downtown Joburg and 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 areas where and at the pockets of of unsafe areas and absolutely um and i think a lot of that problem is 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 fundamentally an economic one in that, you know, just downtown Joburg went through an enormous upheaval, really starting over 30 years ago with the, you know, the, the concept, and I put it in inverted commas, white flight, um, which was, um, and I hesitate to use the term, uh, white monopoly capital, uh, fleeing what was perceived to be the encroachment of, of, of black economic interests uh, and uh, relocating to Santon. Um, and, you know, so, the, so those, those in control of property um, kind of upended themselves, or those, not those in control of property, the, those paying the rentals, the tenants upended themselves and, and left, and took their economic clout with them. Um, and so you had a, you had a process of, of um, change which saw uh, economic a downswing, a massive economic downswing in downtown Joburg. Um, and it has recovered in parts and it's recovered uh, unevenly. So you've got areas uh, where, uh, you know, original tenants are still there, uh, probably because they own their, their buildings, the big banking houses, some of the big mining houses. Uh, and they tend to look after the environments around them. Around them. Um, and then you have other areas that have now have a completely different profile um, and they're equally successful, probably much more successful uh, because the occupiers of those buildings uh, also take ownership of the, the spaces around them in a very different way, uh, really just through kind of occupying them and making sure they stay safe. But then you have other areas that have been occupied, but not by anyone that has any kind of economic stake. 
you know, areas that are simply occupied by squatters or people with no economic means. Um, and those areas remain unsafe because they're disenfranchised, they're marginalized. Um, people in those areas are simply, you know, they're hanging on by their fingernails for survival. Um, and that's not to say that those people are the perpetrators of crime, but what it does mean is that the last thing they're going to do uh, if something happens is get involved because they're, they're just desperately struggling to, to hang on to what little they've got um, and the little kind of, uh, and to stay safe within their own personal space. Um, so I think that's probably the, the kind of dynamic that takes place uh, in, and not just in downtown Joburg, it happens elsewhere as, as, as well. Yeah, last night we were speaking about um, the suburbs and if you follow certain WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups in certain suburbs of Cape Town, generally middle income, wealthy in a South African context, you know, those would be your new crime hotspots, according to the comments and the, the number of people tracked in the area and who's coming and going. So if you, if you follow those Facebook groups, um, uh, the don't suburbs are most started. <laughs> but, but, but you know, those, a lot of those groups are enough to um, to uh, make you nauseous um, because of the things people say, um, not because of the stuff that's reported on them. Um, Rashik, I really need to go. Thank you. We need to go. We need to have lunch because this is yeah. supposed to be lunch and learn, but nobody brought me lunch, so <laughs> it's quite a disappointing situation. Um, but I see. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone. I see some familiar names. Um, we don't want this to go on forever we can but um yeah you can stay in touch with us next week we are looking at uh, mobility which will probably link back to some of the city lift project mapping pedestrian flows um looking at cycling um looking at how we move through spaces um safety of of crossings and that sort of thing so um yeah please join us next week for another hopefully less tech disabled or tech <laughs> tech faulty session but i think we did pretty good um and yeah we have all the possible platforms to ask a question on social media and you have my emails on the internet um uh, yeah just uh continue engaging with us um i there's one or two projects i can't share um that we are working on right now in different places but hopefully in the next month or two and then, of course, Wesley, who's left now, is oh, he's still here. Wesley's still here. Wesley will, uh, if anybody wants to get involved in the 24th of October, I think it is. Uh, yeah, please do. Today. Um, or before then, um, I think we have, we're buying knickknacks on the day. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it should be a fun way of just doing something uh, in a neighborhood that we've been involved in. Uh, Taking thanks the everyone. bull by the horns, you know? Yes, yes, it's all your responsibility. <laughs> And Siska, um, uh, thanks for joining us during your busy work days and yeah, continue engaging and spreading the, the love and the word about uh, spaces and urban spaces and cities. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Guy, for all your time. Thanks, Wesley, Michael, Leo, Olamide, and I will forget some, and Henry. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.